Last presenter of this afternoon uh, of this session, anyway, is uh, going to present unconventional techniques for pearl testing. It's Dr. Chunhui Chun Zhou from GIA. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? OK, thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some unconventional techniques for pearl testing. And more specifically, I'd like to focus on their potential and the limitations from a gemological point of view. So the four uh, unconventional techniques I'm going to cover today are radiocarbon dating, uh, DNA analysis, in-depth chemical and isotope analysis, and the 3D reconstruction of the internal structures. So before I jump into these unconventional techniques, first of all, I'd like to give you a summary on conventional techniques that are currently being employed in the lab for pearl testing. This group of pictures were mostly taken in GIA's Bangkok lab, showing you a number of instrumentations. So routinely used pearl testing techniques, including microscopic examination, long wave, short wave UV fluorescence observation, X-ray imaging techniques such as X-ray radiography, microcomputer X-ray uh, tomography, uh, UV vis spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, Raman photoluminescence, EDXRF X-ray fluorescence, and X-ray fluorescence observation. So, among all these techniques, the most important one is the X-ray imaging which can separate natural pearls from cultured pearls. The other techniques uh, give you additional information about the pearls, such as the growth environment, salt water versus fresh water, uh, such as mollusk, mollusk species origins, or more, more importantly, the color origin of the pearls, whether the color is natural or treated. So while the majority of the pearls can be accurately identified using existing techniques, some challenges still remain. Most of the challenges uh, are from the internal structures. Uh, there are some pearls exhibiting very borderline internal structures, which are very difficult to be interpreted, even by experienced gemologists. Additional challenges including separating some treated versus untreated pearls, or determining some species of the pearls, or separating geographic origin of the pearls. Although separating saltwater versus freshwater pearl is relatively straightforward, there might be some challenges too. We happen to have some interesting samples uh, and with very mixture of saltwater and freshwater chemical pro properties. There's a poster about this. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please stop by. Uh, finally, grading standardization has its own challenge for pearls because there's no universal grading system in the pearl industry. So today, we also have a, a poster session in, in the poster room uh, talking about our GIA's classification standards, how we classify pearls using our seven value factors. So also stop by and take a look. So our ultimate goal is to using new techniques to help with the identification, make separation, may, uh, and reduce uncertainties as much as possible. So the first, um, unconventional technique I'm going to talk about is radiocarbon dating. Uh, Dr. Hodgin just gave you a very detailed one, so I'm just going to be very brief here today. Um, so carbon dating is the most popular unconventional technique that has been done on pearls during the past several years, as you can see from these articles. Uh, GIA was involved in one of the studies just uh, mentioned by Dr. Hodgins. Uh, we tested saltwater natural pearls from the pre to early Columbian era. So um, it's already been proven to be a quite useful tool for pearl testing. So now let's take a look at its potential and limitations. So first of all, the technique is a little bit destructive. Uh, probably about 10 milligram is needed for the testing, which is about 0.05 carat. Not too bad for a big pearl. Um, secondly, unknown local marine reservoir effect for unknown samples, which just explained by Dr. Hodgins. So if you don't know where the pearl were formed, it is, really, it is quite uh, difficult to get an accurate age of the pearl. And the data usually give you a relatively wide age range, maybe 200 years in, in range. So it's also difficult to get an age, uh, accurate age uh, determination. 
However, the potential is probably more than the limitation, in my opinion. First of all, it can support the provenance for uh, historical important uh, pearls, um, provided that you know some, you have some knowledge where the pearl were formed. Such as in our case, we know that the pearl were being found and formed in South America. So even if you do not know where the pearl were formed, the technique still can help with the identification because it can give you an idea whether the pearl is a relatively old pearl or relatively new pearl. Just like explained by Dr. Hodgins, if you can say that the pearl was from a pre-nuclear bomb era, then it is more likely to be a natural pearl. So uh, in summary, this technique has been uh, proven to be a useful tool, and we're going to continue to work on this area in collaboration with Dr. Hodgins. And uh, um, I, I, I believe this technique uh, will be more frequently used in the future, even for our client jobs. So second, DNA barcoding. DNA uh, barcoding is, still, is also a popular technique that has been applied on pearls during the past several years. Uh, it is a well-established method uh, for separating or identifying species of a living organism by looking at a highly variable region of the genome. And uh, um, in theory, pearls should contain DNA because they are formed in a living organism. And this has been confirmed by a number of papers. And uh, most of the papers are involved with marine uh, samples of various pintada species. GI was involved in one of the studies. We have confirmed that pin, uh, the pearl oysters from Japanese pearl farm is pintada, uh, pintada fukara, one of the Akoya pearl, pearl oysters. In addition to marine samples, we also started on um, freshwater uh, pearl samples in collaboration with the uh, University of Guelph in Canada. And today, um, uh, actually, the results has been uh, presented the last year in DNA barcoding conference in South Africa. Today, I'm going to give you a summary on the results, which can help me explaining uh, the limitation and the potential of the technique. So here you can see 22 freshwater pearl samples sent for DNA analysis. And uh, among these, eight samples, the DNA, uh, DNA sequences of eight samples can be successfully extracted and identified, and the results fully matched our expectation. For example, Chinese freshwater cultured pearls came out as high rheopsis uh, species. American freshwater pearls came out as either washboard or pink heel, uh, pink heel splitter, which are common American freshwater pearl mussels. So this is very promising. However, if you look at the table, many of the samples do not have enough DNA yield. So let's, let's just mention about why. So first of all, the limitation, similar to carbon dating, you need to get some powders for DNA extraction. Somewhere at, at least 10 milligram is needed. However, even you do that, there's no guarantee that you will get the DNA from the sample. Why is that? Maybe there's not enough DNA to start with. Or maybe the pearls has been processed or treated in a way that DNA has been degraded, destroyed. Uh, for example, Chinese freshwater pearls are usually being bleached, heated in chemicals. So all these processes could damage the DNA content inside. All right? However, if, if you can successfully uh, extract DNA from the sample, so you will almost always get an accurate species or at least a genus determination, which can help with the, uh, the geographic origin of the sample, which can help with the identification of the sample. So it can solve three issues in one shot. So it is very good technique uh, for pearl testing. However, we're going to continue to work on this area, especially in terms of uh, DNA recovery uh, for the future. Next in-depth chemical and isotope analysis. So chemical analysis is routinely being used uh, in pearl testing, but mainly limited to certain, uh, certain trace elements, such as manganese and strontine, to separating different uh, uh, environments, salt water, fresh water. In GIA, we started to look at the potential uh, to separate pearls from different geographic origins. Uh, one of the study was involved in freshwater pearl samples, uh, and, uh, and one of the uh, it will be have an article in the next uh, in the next year GNG issue. So basically, we tested hundreds of freshwater pearl samples and they use LDA analysis, um, which is already being explained earlier. 
so I don't have to say anything about it. Uh, so using LDA analysis uh, to choose the elements to maximize uh, the, uh, the separation from different regions, so far we see a, well re a relatively well-defined separation uh, using this method. Uh, however, uh, in order to make this method more useful, we have to uh, collect large known samples from known locations in order to put it into the database to cover more regions to be able to get a more accurate separation. And it is inevitable uh, for some pearls to have trace elements that were overlapping each other from different regions. So for some pearls, it may not be separable. Recently, we also conducted an interesting study on oxygen isotope ratio of pearls. Um, oxygen isotope ratio can be used to extrapolate the growth, uh, growth environment, especially the water temperature during that growth. So here is an example of the study. Uh, so we use uh, some uh, freshwater non bee cultured pearls from Kentucky Lake, and here you see a cross section of the pearl, we cut it in half, and we did the spot analysis using a secondary ion mass spectrometer uh, along the growth of the pearl. Uh, so there are two directions, A and B. If you look at this graph, uh, this is uh, the, all the spots indicating a change in oxygen isotope ratio. Uh, if you look, uh, the lower oxygen isotope ratio indicating growth in a hot temperature the higher oxygen isotope ratio indicating growth in a colder temperature. So if you look at the, this graph from the center, center is the center line, the starting point of the growth, to the edge, to the left side in direction A, there are two cycles. Two cycles meaning two summer growth. This pearl has been grown for a year and a half from an oxygen isotope ratio study. And if you look at direction B, we only did a half of the uh, direction there's only one cycle, and then something happened in the black area. Uh, some abnormal growth happened during the winter after the first summer. So we can get a lot of interesting information from oxygen isotope ratio studies. Uh, for example, look at all these spots. They are all at the lower part of the uh, graph. That means pearls grew much, much faster in summer than in winter, which is, makes a lot of sense. So in the future, well, actually, this test, first of all, our goal is to see whether a pearl can be used as a proxy for paleoclimate study, which I think it is a very good candidate for that. But in the future, we are trying to see whether this technique can be used to separate pearls from different geographic origins. This is still at the early stage of the research, so we are going to continue to collect data. Similar to chemical studies, we have to collect a more known sample from known locations in order to make a good separation. And uh, it's probably uh, inevitable that some of the samples will have overlapping data uh, among different regions. So next, 3D reconstruction of the internal structures. Uh, normally, a gemologist look at the 2D radiographic image or uh, uh, to the uh, CT slice to interpret the internal structure of the pearls. Uh, in GIA, we can uh, combine CT slices with advanced computer software to reconstruct the internal structure of the pearl in 3D. So here is, a, here is an example. We actually have a pearl being cultured using a small gastropod shell. Uh, this is an atypical bee culture the pearl project done by uh, Ken and uh, uh, our colleagues. So um, here is the two-dimensional CT slice showing the shell structure inside. We can select the shell structure in each of the CT slice and then reconstruct into a three-dimensional uh, picture. Uh, so this three-dimensional picture can give you the very detailed orientation and shape of the internal structure without you need to cut the pearl open. So this is very nice. So it gives you a very clear view of the internal structure in 3D form, however, no matter how clear the internal structure is, some of the structure need to be interpreted by persons, which can vary among different gemologists. So this is one of the limitations for the technique. Just going to show you a very nice, cute uh, video here. So there's another pearl. We have a freshwater cultured pearl using a flower-shaped uh, bead, which they are trying to make a flower-shaped pearl. So using uh, 3D reconstruction, we can actually uh, give it, uh, tell that there's a flower-shaped bee shell and a half dome, they glue together. 
trying to make the pearl a little bit fatter. All right, so, so this is what it looked like. I actually have some samples with me today. If you want to see, it's being cut, so you can see what's exactly inside. So finally, um, there are a number of techniques mentioned in the literature, which I don't have time to talk about today. Um, so many of the techniques are using the alternative imaging systems. For example, uh, X-ray phase contrast, neutral imaging, optical coherence tomography. So uh, these uh, techniques can give you interesting and maybe complementary information about the internal structure of the pearls. Uh, they also have their own limitations. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, X-ray radiography and a CT, uh, CT uh, technique is still the most useful technique for looking at the internal structure of the pearls. And uh, um, in GIA, we're going to continue to uh, investigate different techniques for the future uh, to, uh, to help with the identification, to help with the existing technique. So just want to thank you uh, and also all the collaborators involved with the by the way, this is a freshwater natural pro. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chun Hui. Uh, do we have questions? We have a few minutes. In the back. Um, question for the speaker, for the previous speaker as well. Um, when you're looking at the carbon dating, is there a possibility, especially in the freshwater environment where you can't access a library of existing mollusks, to move outside of, a little bit outside of the biology and maybe use things like coral rings where you can get a time profile, you could use trona deposits, other calcium carbonate deposits to give you a temperature, or to give you a time profile to add to the carbon dating? That's actually a very good idea. Um, Freshwater is definitely the, uh, the most uh, uh, difficult ones to test. So, so far, we haven't tested any freshwater pearls using carbon dating. So I think uh, Dr. Hodgins just gave a very good idea to try and to collect uh, samples of known location, no, uh, known places, to help with, them, with the um, correction of the uh, local, lo local environment correction data. So yes, um, we can use a, a number of uh, species or a number of other materials to help get to get the correction number for each different locations. But fresh water is definitely a very difficult one. Uh, so most of the work we have done uh, are using uh, marine samples. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay then, well thank you very much, Junwin. Thank you.